Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so yeah, indeed, I'm going to be talking about um, Kubernetes. I'm going to talk about how you can manage your infrastructure a bit like Google. I mean, clearly, maybe not all of us have got the problem that Google has, um, but we can be rest assured that if they're solving it pretty well and they're open sourcing it, then perhaps it's something we can probably use as well. Um, the previous talk, or one of the previous talks by James, an excellent talk as always, um, was about Kubernetes. He loves it. He can he cannot talk about it. Um, so there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be very familiar. But I what I hope is that you took took some note of James's talk, and you're going to take some note of mine uh, and go with it at the end of the day and hopefully play with it. Um, just very very quickly about me. Um, so I look after engineering and consulting at uh, a startup called Jetstack. Uh, that's one of our own startups we've had just over the last year. I used to work at MongoDB. Um, so for anyone who loves or hates perhaps MongoDB, I don't know. Um, and previously I was at Deutsche Telekom and Data, uh, Datica, so I've done uh, basically lots of data processing and analytics. Um, writing Go, Python, Java, in that order, actually. Um, and I'm a big, big fan of Kubernetes, I've been using it for probably about the last year. Um, in open source, we've been doing customer deployments, we've been doing open source contributions. Um, so yeah, we, we have our head in it pretty regularly. Anyone heard of containers, by any chance? No, I thought not. Um, yeah, so everyone seems to be talking about these things. Um, very, very buzzwordy at the moment. Um, hopefully for all the right reasons. You know, containers actually genuinely are very, very useful. Um, incredibly lightweight, uh, small, uh, very, very quick to start, very quick to stop. These things are really, very useful, particularly if you compare them to a VM. They're really portable, so we can make something here on my laptop, and I can then put it into a cloud environment, and I can be assured that the, uh, the, the operation of that is going to be exactly the same. It looks exactly the same. It's isolated, so I can be sure that uh, one container can interfere with another container, or indeed that it's uh, isolated from the host, um, and it's consistent as well. Yeah, these, these things are immutable. So I, as I said, we're going to get this dev prod parity that everyone loves. You know, you can be sure that what you're doing in dev is precisely what you end up with in prod. Well, at least that's the plan. Uh, anyway, um, so VMs containers, that's kind of what it looks like. Why would we do containers? Well, they're, they're actually really, really efficient. We're not having to have the entire operating system again. We're not having to replicate the kernel um, because actually we've got a kernel that does really, really good level of uh, virtualization for us. So for that reason, um, Docker's come along. Um, uh, Docker is actually, as people know, if you know, containers are not really that new, to be honest. Containers have been around for a while. So if you've ever used FreeBSD Jail, Solaris Zones, OpenVZ, if you've had very cheap hosting um, with a VPS provider, you've probably had a container. You've not really had a machine, not really. You might think you've got a machine, uh, but actually what you've got is a, a very small slice of that machine. Uh, it's probably incredibly overcommitted um, as, as well. Has anyone used any of these at the bottom here? A few people familiar with these things? Yeah, so these things have been around a while. Um, containers really have just been popularized by Docker. Docker's come along, Docker Inc. Uh, they've started a great open source project. Uh, they used to be a PaaS, actually, interestingly. They, they didn't just do containers. They actually were a PaaS. They operated containers in production for some time. And they've brought the open source project along. And there's been a number of these now projects which have kind of come out of Docker. But the really great thing that they've done is they've popularized the use of containers. And containers, in certainly the last 12 months that we've been out and about, uh, has become very, very, uh, very, very persuasive, um, basically. So all these good things that we get. The problem is, though, containers in production are actually pretty challenging. So there's one thing running Docker on your laptop, so dockerizing some Nginx application that you've got, maybe dockerizing a database. But actually, it gets really tricky when you want to actually put this into production, particularly as you're not then dealing with just like one, one or two containers. You're more likely to be dealing with like many, many more containers. So you've got this kind of problem that you've got well, multiple hosts, because you don't just want one server. You want to actually scale this. You may have multiple machines. You may have multiple data centers if you're doing things properly, and you want to have high availability and disaster recovery facilities. You need to be able to manage these things as well. Like, How do you get the container in the right place? Now, if you had a handful of containers, you could probably do that yourself. You could hand crank some scripts, which would get you um, to better put the container in the right place. That's, that's probably quite easy. But it's actually really, really tricky when you, um, you want to do this at scale. So you're having to put things in the right place and decide where they go. That's actually quite tricky. You imagine having hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, even more of these things. That's, that's particularly hard. That's kind of fun. Then you've also got logging and monitoring. How, how do you do that now? So you're saying you've got a container. Just It's a user space process, um, much like you would put inside a VM. But because we've now got lots of these containers potentially all spewing out output, how do we capture all of that? Yeah, where does it go? I mean, where do we centralize it to? How do we monitor these things? Because they are just processes. How do we monitor their, their, their usage of um, CPU and RAM and everything else? Um, 
Networking, okay, this becomes really tricky. If you've now got um, lots, lots more containers, let's imagine your one VM uh, has suddenly now become like 10, if not maybe more uh, containers. You've, you, you need lots more IP. Suddenly the your IP address requirement goes up quite considerably. And as we all know, you know IPs are not, uh, you know, they're not infinite. So um, we have problems there in achieving uh, the number of IPs that we need. And we need to be able to read these things around. And there's also this final one, which is storage. Did anyone go to Luke's talk out of interest? Yeah, so Luke probably eloquently sort of described this, this problem, and, and, and I'll probably I'll get on to how Kubernetes solves it. But effectively, what we've got here are no pets. No, no longer have we got a server that's called Bob that we look after and tend to and kind of make patches to. We, that's not the world that this is. The world is that here that things can move around. See, my application could potentially go from one node to, to another. That's going to be managed for me. Therefore, I can't tie the data to that server. Um, I need to be able to make the data a bit more portable. And uh, what Cluster HQ are doing in Flocker is a really interesting way of kind of being able to hook up your container with your data volume and for it to follow, follow, follow it around, perhaps even vice versa, to schedule it to where the data is. So it's pretty, it's pretty difficult. Um, so it turns out there's some pretty good people <laughs> who have done this before. Um, so James actually spoke about this. Go Google have actually been working very, very hard at having um, containers in their uh, data, uh, data centers. And they've been doing this for actually over a decade. So this is actually almost like pre-virtualization. They had to solve these problems before the likes of VMware were giving us VMs. Um, so what did they do? Well, they looked at the kernel, and they looked at various things in the kernel that they could take advantage of. And the ways in which they can contribute, so they made you know, some contributors things, things like LXC um, and a variety of other things, which are now sort of making their way out into the open source. And they developed a system called Borg, uh, which they use basically internally to manage pretty much everything. I used to say everything here, but then I was corrected, and I uh, said almost everything. So really, and actually what they mean by that is literally everything. We'll see on the next slide some of those kind of things that do run in containers. They launched two billion of these things, obviously very proud of their big numbers. Um, we probably will never get to that kind of scale, but it kind of gives you an indication as to the scale that they're having to deal with. Um, as I said, if, if they can deal at that scale, you can be rest assured that it might work for you. Why, why do this? Um, well, they have huge, huge different workloads that they need to, to manage, and they want the Spore system to be able to do that hard job for them, rather than them having to work out where things go, how to network things together, how to get the right storage in the right place. That's all the types, the types of things that Borg does. Now, the great thing is that they've actually open sourced this. Like, they seem to have just open sourced pretty much most of the, the really funky stuff they do. Uh, just this morning, they actually re, uh, launched a paper on how to do layer two and layer three software load balancing. So if you want to know how actually their load balancer works on GCP, they've written a paper. You can go out and actually read it. So much like this. So this is the Borg paper. It's a really interesting read. Maybe a bedtime read, I don't know, but, perhaps. Um, but really, really interesting. Um, and what it tells us are a few things, but I wanted to just pull out a few, few, few quotes. So Borg cells basically run everything. So we're talking about here completely heterogeneous workloads. We're not just talking about front ends. We're, we're also talking about being able to handle the much longer running tasks, uh, longer running tasks, and also the short data intensive tasks. So look at some of those things I put in bold there. This thing runs Gmail, Google Docs, Web Search. These are all the things that we rely, in, uh, rely on day in, day out. Um, big table. And it needs better to run these things absolutely uh, and equally well. So what is Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes is effectively the open source version of Borg. What they've done is they've launched the paper, and rather than actually just give it up to someone else to go and develop, which is quite often what's happened with a lot of other Google papers, they've actually gone ahead, taken a development team that they have internally uh, that actually worked on Borg, and they've now put them out into the open source to create this open source version. And it builds on their experience. It's not the, exactly the same code base. They've decided in this case to use Go. Anyone here using Go out of interest? Oh, a few people, great. So they've used Go. Go seems to be pretty popular right now for, for distributed systems. Um, you've got the likes of XCD, you've got Chorus, all sorts of projects who are picking up Go. Um, but what they've done is they've tried to learn all the lessons from what they did really well and what they did probably perhaps not quite so well. Uh, and they've put that out into an open source project. And it turns out this open source project has become incredibly popular, um, as, as we'll kind of see. This, here's an indication. This is actually a really old screenshot. So if you hit GitHub today, you'll probably see some even large numbers. But we're talking here about, it's version 1.1. So this, just put this in context. It's still relatively early in the, in the release cycle. It's, it's about a year old, just over a year old. Um, you've got 700 contributors from across industry, so Red Hat, 
James from Red Hat, who spoke earlier, Red Hat are actually one of the major contributors, but you've got the likes of Samsung in there, you've got the likes of eBay, some, some pretty, pretty huge names who, again, know how to deal and scale and who are contributing some of their lessons back to how this should work. 25,000 commits, um, 13,000 stars, 1,000 watches. I mean, you know, take what you want from these numbers, but th this is a very, very popular project. I, I would argue it's probably maybe one of the most popular open source projects around at the moment, um, which makes it incredibly hard to keep track with um, day to day. Uh, I have watches on various issues, and overnight, you know, it's just an email box full of like uh, updates. But that kind of says a lot about the the quality of the ecosystem um, that's growing. So if you're looking at this and thinking, is it well supported? Maybe it's just one of these kind of flush in the pan Google projects where they launch like App Engine and they kind of take kind of withdrawal support. It's far from it. In fact, it's uh, it's it's really cool. got quite a lot behind it. So it kind of runs everywhere. I think James kind of mentioned this. It's not Google specific. People think this just runs on Google's cloud platform. It doesn't. It runs anywhere. You know, you can download the source code today. You can compile it and run it on your laptop. Um, it's that easy. You can run it out on AWS. In fact, most of our installations have been out on AWS. It just tends to be where most people uh, right, are right now. Um, you can run it on bare metal. That's a pretty interesting option. If you're running containers on bare metal, you get much more native host performance. And um, it's application centric. I think this is the important thing. So if you head down to the bottom there, it says manage applications and not servers. So we are not thinking here about the actual servers we're dealing with. We're not thinking about the pets. What we are thinking about are our applications in terms of pods and services and everything else, which I'll get to. That's a really, really important thing to consider. So what human is, is effectively a way of you being able to declare what you want your system, your application to look like. So it's declarative and it uses a number of different application abstractions. There's a lot of these. We're, we're going to kind of touch on really some of the most important ones, but there are increasing numbers of these abstractions that help you think about your application, again, rather than the actual nuts and bolts of what goes on with the container or the network or anything else. Um, so effectively, it kind of herds the cattle, if you like, pretty much. It takes all of your various nodes, which might live in multiple places. You know, you might have bare metal, you might have AWS instances, you might have even as you, I mean, you could in the future take these pools of resource and think about them just as compute and let Kubernetes handle and herd them for you. Um, and then you uh, can make your declaration as to what you want to run on it and it will do the job for you. And we'll see how that kind of works. So it proactively monitors, uh, it scales, it can auto scale, we'll talk about this. It also heals. This is pretty awesome. You know, no getting out in the middle of the night when something's gone wrong. There is a system here that's that's working for you, not against you, uh, and updating. So we'll kind of see what this looks like. Some of the um, core primitives then. So we're gonna these ones the, the, the core ones, and there's there's a bunch more that we'll kind of tackle. Um, James calls these the subatomic particles. I like the way of describing that because this is really it. If you nail these, then then I think you certainly probably getting your your head around how things how how things work in Kubernetes. Nodes, pods, replication controllers, labels, services. Um, before we delve in to those in particular, I just want to look at what the control plane looks like because it's really simple. Um, it might not seem it, but it is actually really, really simple. Uh, effectively, you have a control plane, which is sometimes referred to as the master, and that consists of like a number of kind of core components, really, uh, that are really the brains of Kubernetes. Um, a couple of things we've got. So we've got a scheduler. We'll get to this. This is, the, you know, this is the, the piece of code that's responsible for getting your container onto an actual node, makes a, a scheduling decision. You've got a, a controller manager that runs a variety of controllers that do various things. For instance, making sure that pods are running, making sure various things are in the right place. You've also got um, an API server. So we can obviously sort of talk to Kubernetes because it's going to be a bit useless if we, if we couldn't actually negotiate and talk to it. So we've got an API server that talks REST, uh, so we can take any client. Um, and we've also, this is all backed by etcd. Has anyone, anyone heard, heard of etcd? Yeah, a few, a few people. So, um, so effectively for distributed configuration management. So this is like the back end. This is where all our state effectively lives. Uh, and that state is then shared. So all of these components all get to see this sort of same view of the world. So that's our master plane, pretty simple. Um, and we've then got a bunch of nodes, as I said. They, these nodes are physical machines, they're virtual machines. They're, they are machines in very different clouds environments, um, and they each have something called a kubelet, which we'll come to. So kubelet is supposed to be responsible for taking a request to run a container and actually do the work of running that container for you. So effectively, kubelet sits on top of you know, the likes of Docker. It take, takes your request, talks to Docker, and does all that kind of hard work for you, so you don't have to uh, worry about instantiating it, making sure the volume's in the right place, the network's set up, that type of thing. 
And how do we talk to it? Well, we can use a variety of different clients. So we can talk over using the API server, or we can use something called kubectl, or kubectl, I think it's sometimes referred to, uh, in, order to uh, in order to talk to it. So all backed by etcd. I think a few of you have probably heard of it, used it. Um, this is a core OS project. Uh, it's effectively for like taking etc, but putting, you know, distributing it. So it's, it's called etcd. Um, it's based on a CP, so for anyone that likes CAP, and um, this is all about consistency, first and foremost. This is making your data safe. Uh, but also, um, it, it can afford to lose uh, instances as long as it has quorum. Um, I'm sure there's some good talks later today about NoSQL, which we'll, which we'll talk about CAP and all the various different uh, ways that that can be used. Um, so etcd sits, sits under the bonnet. What does a node look like? Well, as I said, it's a physical virtual host. It requires network connectivity, usually the same data center and runs pods and uh, proxy service requests. So if you look at this diagram here, uh, kind of massively, hopefully overly, overly simplified it, um, we've got the kubelet. The kubelet talks to the API server, receives its requests to, to do work, and actually goes ahead and does that work locally on the node. Um, and we've got sets of pods. Um, we'll, we'll look at this shortly. And we've also got a proxy, uh, which I'll talk more, more about. So what does the, the kubelet specifically do? The kubelet watches for pods to be assigned. Uh, we'll see a little flow for how that specifically works. It does the work of mounting volumes. So if you want to take a volume, be it an EBS volume, maybe a local volume, maybe a Gluster volume, I mean, what it, whatever it might be, it actually does the hard work of wiring it up for you. So you'd have to do that. Has anyone fiddled around with like Docker, hyphen V, that, or that, that, that kind of disappears for you. Um, it installs secrets, so if you've got passwords and things, it kind of injects those into the pod, which is pretty neat, so that you don't have to worry about getting those secrets into your application, so maybe putting it and baking it into the image, that, that's, that goes away. It runs the pod itself, pretty simply, right? It goes to Docker and does the Docker run and manages it. And it also reports all of that status as well, because clearly if the pod's running, that's good. If the pod's not running, it needs to report that back to, to, to the master uh, as well. Um, that's kind of our kubelet. And then we've also got a kube uh, proxy. I'll probably talk more about this in a bit more detail. But this is effectively responsible for getting, making sure that we can yeah, access services across the cluster. Final thing here, importantly, is we've got Docker. Um, but the really important thing to know, and I sort of bolded in it, and bolded in it here, is um, this is not Docker specific. Um, this has been built uh, really agnostic of any particular container runtime. So you could use the likes of Rocket. Any, anyone heard of Rocket, RKT? Yeah, so again, Rocket's another container runtime from, it's from CoreOS, uh, worth looking at. It's a, it's a kind of competing standard, if you, if you, if you like. Um, so yeah, you can actually plug in and plug out these things as you need. But certainly the Docker is the most popular. It's, everyone seems to be familiar with Docker. Um, but don't think you're tied to it, though. No, this, is, this is completely agnostic, uh, should you wish. OK, what does a pod look like? Well, as James kind of said earlier, pod obviously is a group of whales. It's a, it's a kind of play on, on, on the Docker whale. Um, effectively, why, why, would we, oh, so why, why would we put two things together? Well, there might be lots of reasons why you want to take more than one process uh, and for it to maybe share the same volume, for instance, or you maybe want it to have the same fate, and that is you want it to start and stop together. Um, so for that reason, you can take multiple containers and you can put them in, in, in a pod. The example I've got here is a pod that's running like a web container, so you might say something like Nginx, um, but you might want a little helper container that's doing some piece of work for you. So for instance, I've got an example here of like a, a little piece of code that might go off to Git to sync maybe a branch that you've, you, you, know, you, you want to pull, pull down. So this is kind of like a typical example. The Git sync would actually write to the volume, the volume is shared, Nginx then picks up everything that it needs in order to run. So it's just not um, volumes. You've also got shared namespaces for things like networking and IPC, so you can do things like shared memory. And UTS, so you know, if you want to talk local host, you, know, you, you can talk local host to, 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 to each other. So this is pretty good. Um, ways this is what we use, data pullers, pushers, proxies, all sorts of various things that you can do um, with that. Um, one important thing to note, which uh, again, James pointed out earlier, this is an IP per pod. So a pod, when it gets launched into Kubernetes, actually gets an IP. So it is addressable. So one pod can talk to another pod across hosts um, as well. We'll see why this is useful. Uh, later. So, okay, typical pod, uh, really, really simple one here. We've got a piece of YAML. Uh, this is just um, a very small Node.js app that we've built. You can actually go and Docker pull this if you really want. It's pretty unexciting, um, but but it, it, it will probably work. It should work. It's a good test, isn't it? 
of a container being portable. But you can basically pull it down. This basically says, look, I want to run a pod. This is what it's called. I've got a bunch of labels. Labels are really important, as we'll see. So these are kind of key value pairs that we can assign like really any object in Kubernetes. So we can find it again, uh, effectively. Um, so I've got, the, I've got the image here, as you can probably see. Um, this just uh, has at least a content management system, really, that's backed by a file database. So this is really, really simple stuff. All we want to do here is just run Node.js app, back it by some files, and then serve those files uh, out through a little, uh, little, little, little UI. In fact, sorry, via REST API in this case. And then all we want to do is uh, expose that via port 80. So kind of behind the scenes, what, what really happens here? Um, or I suppose there's 50,000 kind of vert views. Um, but what, what really happens is, effectively, you take your YAML, um, you pass it through to the kubectl. We're going to actually we can actually do this. Um, that behind the scenes then makes a post back to the API server. The API server receives that, records it, records it as having being a pod that basically doesn't have a host. It's lacking. Uh, it's not bound to a host. It hasn't yet been assigned. And what you've got in the background is a little watch happening. You probably see up there. You've got a little watch happening. So uh, what it would be doing is the scheduler would be watching for anything that's unscheduled effectively. Once it receives something, it will then make a scheduling decision. At that point, it then does a bind. So it says, look, you know, you over there, you're having this container. Um, the kubelet then gets instructed to go ahead and do that piece of work. It then talks to Docker. Docker then runs the pod. Hopefully that all makes sense. It's an interesting flight, and it's actually interesting because in the source code, you can actually follow this. So if you know where to go, even if you don't know where to go, it's actually quite quite easy uh, in some cases to follow uh, some of this. As so we've got labels, um, labels are absolutely important. I mean, labels are used pretty much everywhere. If fairness, you probably might get sick of them because they, they do <coughs> repeat quite often, um, but for, in some cases for, you know, for good reason. So what I can effectively do here is I can take keys and values and I can attach it to any API object. So I can do it to pods, I can do it to replication controllers, services. This is so I can find it again. Or, so I say me as a user, but also an, as, oh, an application can find it again. And also so it can be used internally uh, as well. So this identifies attributes. We can change it over time as well. So you're not, you know, you're not bound by the labels that you've set at the beginning. You can change them, and that might become important. Used, used a lot through Kubernetes, we'll see it. Um, I've got a couple of examples there of taking maybe two pods. Maybe you've got like, maybe they've got a shared label, which is the application name, but one's got a different version number. So you might con be concurrently running like a different version. Like, say for instance, if you're like canarying like version 0.2, uh, you might want to put that outside, out there alongside it. And then we've got the sort of selectors, which we can then use in order to always like pick from the pool, if you like. And that's based on things like a quality. Like, look, I'm looking for all containers, all pods, sorry, which um, are called a particular name. Um, or I'm looking for all of my pods that are in my front end here, that they're serving my front end, or everything that's in my back end that's version 2. Or maybe I'm looking for all nodes which have an SSD in them. I mean, it, you can, this is completely extensible. You can use these in, in whatever uh, way you, you kind of fancy. And there's also sets as well. I mean, you can go handy some kind of set type operators on the labels. OK, so pretty straightforward to get an actual um, pod running. Um, have I got a command? Oh, I've got one down there. But the, the problem with a pod, just on its own anyway, is that if that pod were to die, uh, for whatever reason, maybe the process were to die, or maybe if the node that it's on were to go down, you know, maybe you were to accidentally shut it down, or maybe someone's to pull a power cord out, um, that pod doesn't come back which is pretty useless, really, if you want it to run in some kind of real environment. Uh, so for that very reason, there's something called a replication controller. Now, this is, again, a piece of code, a process that runs on your behalf um, on the server side that proactively monitors the pod. It makes sure that at all, all times it's running. But what it really more specifically does is it makes sure that your desired state is the actual state and does everything it does to concept, effectively converge it to that state. So for instance, if I wanted to actually say run three of these things rather than just one, it would realize that there's only one and go ahead and do the work that's necessary to, to get it from one state to the other. In that case, it will be starting an extra two instances and it will keep monitoring that those three are alive and working. If one of them were to go down, it would then do the work that's necessary to bring another one back up. And that might mean scheduling somewhere else. It might mean going to a different VM, perhaps, uh, and bringing it up elsewhere. But the nice thing is this is working for you. There's, there's, again, there's no getting out of bed at 4 a.m. When, uh, you know, when something's gone down. And interestingly, 
there actually there is work underway at the moment to actually auto scale this. So rather than you having to worry about scaling it more manually, um, you've got a little process that can sit in the background monitoring things like CPU usage. And once your pod gets pretty loaded, you can then just go ahead and create another one uh, in, in the background. So what does one of these look like? Well, yeah, some lovely YAML uh, again, um, or perhaps maybe Jason's your flavor, so you can use Jason. But this is really kind of what it looks like. It says, look, I want to run, uh, I want to run two of these things. I label the controller. Um, I label um, what I actually want to create. So you can see here what it's basically saying. It's almost like cookie cutting, if you like, the pod. And you can see that because it's got a little template section. So it says, when you, when you go ahead and create this, I want you to use this as the template. Uh, to, to create. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm referring to the same container, so node CMS file. It's exactly the same, exactly the same version. Um, I'm exposing it on port 80. I'm giving it some, uh, some, some labels, as you can probably see. And in order to know what to manage, it's got that selector there at the very top. Um, so you can probably see it knows that it's managing the pool of uh, pods that have that metadata that belong to them. And if I want to go ahead and create it, I just, I just use kubectl create f. So I'm basically passing it a file that contains my manifest. It goes and does the work in the background and kind of creates it, uh, kind of creates it for me. So what I might do is just show you that. Oh, let's see if we can. Oh, there's my. There we go. We'll get, we'll get a new window. Uh, can everyone see it? OK. Yeah, good. So I've done probably the worst thing possible, which is to try and show you something a bit live. Um, <laughs> and I'm actually going to try and show you something live that's running in running in AWS. So you think, actually, so far, so good, right? We can SSH <laughs> into a box. Um, so I'm running, basically, a Kubernetes cluster in AWS. We've got three instances running across three availability zones. So I've got A, B, and C in, in Europe. Um, the idea being here that I can schedule something for high availability. So if one zone were to go down, I've got the ability to fail back to the other two zones. OK, so kubectl is the command that I was talking about. Uh, I just want to show you a few things that I've already got running. So I've actually kind of already cheated, uh, <laughs> sort of Blue Peter style, and got a few things running just in case. Um, so what I've actually set up in the background is I've got a running instance of MongoDB. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, I've also got a running instance of Redis in the background. Uh, and I've also got a, a small little application that we're going to use later called Node Upvote. So all these things are kind of running. So these are my these are my running pods. And probably what you see with kubectl is you've got this really, really simple way, almost like RESTful type way of referring to the objects. So in this case, I'm basically just asking it to do a get of all the pods that are running, in, the, in this case, in the default namespace. Now, if I want to go ahead and actually run another pod, um, you probably saw there was the create method that we had earlier. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to create file, but I'm actually going to use uh, a. Oops, let's get into the right directory. So I've got a bunch of manifests in here that I'm going to use, um, and I'm going to create not the proxy quite yet. I'm going to uh, create a so-called deployment, and what this is going to do. Um, it's something new I'll talk about a little bit later, I've got a slide on, um, is it's basically going to manage the replication controller for the pods that you just saw. I'm basically just going to run, hopefully run this. So, yep, no CMS deployment has been created. If I now go ahead and look at the pods, what you can hopefully see <laughs> is, um, yeah, six seconds ago, it launched a new container. So this is an instance of Node CMS. Um, we can actually go and take a look at it in a bit more detail if we want. So we could could actually describe this pod, and uh, I'm not going to attempt to type that. Just kind of copy and paste it. Um, oh, oh, says sorry. Describe pod. Oh, thank you. Yeah, cool. Right, so yeah, okay, this is a little bit of background as kind of what's really what's happening here. But as you can probably see, um, it's exactly the same image as before. So it's um, yet yeah, slash node CMS file, it's got the same version. It's told me where this has landed, so I now know the node that has been scheduled with this container. Um, and um, we've also got an IP, so this is actually IP addressable. I can actually talk to, to, to this. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this, but this is effectively using an overlay to achieve this. There's a variety of ways that you can network in Kubernetes. I'm using something called Flannel, which is a software-based overlay. Um, but it effectively, it gives me an IP. This is important, because I can now access that IP, and I can see whether things basically kind of work um, or not. So this all kind of looks, all looks fine. We've got a variety of environment variables. We'll come to this later. It's got a little bit of event history, so I can kind of see what was going on as well, so I can see 
uh, yeah, I can see the decision-making basically process that was made in order to get it in, in the right place. So that kind of looks good. Um, let's just copy the IP, uh, 10 2, 4, 6, 17, 7 is good. And what we're actually going to do is exit there. I'm going to head into my controller. Um, because I was just running on a bastion prior to that, so it didn't have uh, access to the network. So let's just, ooh, 404, <coughs> it's okay, it's fine, I think. Um, yeah, here you go, yeah, so if I basically just call v1 article, I'm, I've got a node, node backend, node that's just serving some JSON up. Really, really, really simple. So kind of works at the moment, I think, so. Um, that's all good, okay. Let me find my slides. Interesting, isn't it? Where's my uh... oh. oh, bear with me. Here we go. Are we back here? No. no. Let's maximize all. Oh, no. It's kind of a bit odd, isn't it? We got we got this, so any bright ideas from anyone? Just <laughs> <coughs> try to find me. Hmm. Is it hiding somewhere maybe? Okay, let's just uh switch my display, sorry about this. Um, so I switched Linux tests for the weekend, so perhaps I need to learn more about that, that particular window manager. Okay, so okay, what happens in terms of scheduling? Okay, so effectively what you've got in Kubernetes is a shared state scheduler. That, what that means effectively is that the state um, is saved in etcd and everyone, or all the components can see that state. So they can make a decision about where to schedule um, the pod. Effectively what you've really got is this kind of problem here of, of really Tetris. You're taking these multiple containers that you have, requests for creating containers, and you've only obviously got finite resource on each of the uh, each of the each of the servers. So in this case, we've got a couple of nodes. It's going to make a decision about where to uh, effectively where to land this. There's an out of the box scheduler. Um, it's effectively sort of predicate based with prioritization. Basically, it first of all has a set of rules uh, which it uh, uses in order to create a list, and it then sort of prioritizes that list of nodes then to schedule onto. Three stages: filter the nodes if that's necessary. Um, prioritize those filtered lists uh, and then select effectively the best the best fit um, and what that will do is then put that uh, pod uh, onto the node the interesting thing to point out here is this is going to be scheduled I think it is in fact already pluggable <laughs> so if you really want you can actually go ahead and write your own scheduler perhaps uh, you're not happy with the way that the scheduler works right now so you might want to do it in some slightly different way uh, and that's kind of open to you there's also this idea in the future that you'll be able to have multiple schedulers so obviously clearly some schedulers might be good at particular workloads whereas some of those might not be quite so good. So yeah, we'll just choose, choose from them. Okay, so up until now, what I've been doing is yeah, I've just been spinning up pods, um, but they've been basically having their data backed by a file. Um, now, I've actually baked the file inside the container image, which is really not the way to go because um, yeah, we're, there's no easy way of being able to update that, which actually has to, to re-release the container, which some people might think is a good thing because you can version the container. Um, but what I really want to do is, uh, particularly in the case of a database, is I actually really want a volume that sits behind this that's persistent, um, that's going to save it away to some uh, persistent um, storage. So in this case, I might be using something like EBS as an example. So in Kubernetes, you've got two different types uh, of concepts here. You've got um, the very simple volume, uh, and then you've also got um, so that includes things like empty directories, which sit on the host, um, which are very tied, of course, to, to that particular host. So if your pod were to end up somewhere else, they wouldn't be able to see the same data again. 
Um, but for that reason, there is this notion of a persistent volume. So this is what a volume that so long lives, basically, the running of that container. So that is maybe, you, like in the case of a database, you want to be able to reattach that data later if you know, the pod were somewhere different. And then here you can use like lots of different type volume types. And this is actually one of the great things about the Kubernetes ecosystem is that people have gone out and developed loads of their own different plugins. It's completely, a completely open source project. So you know, we've got things like Ceph and Gluster and iSCSI and um, even Flocker in there as well. We actually built the Flocker plugin uh, with uh, Cluster HQ. So you can use a variety of different plugins depending on the environment that you're in. Um, and these plugins will do the work of going to create the volume for you. So you don't have to actually go and sort of use the EC2 API, for instance, to create your volume. Um, you can actually just make a, re make a request for a volume. That, that request will then be fulfilled by talking to the API on your behalf, which is, uh, which is pretty neat. Okay, the one thing um, that's really very also neat about the persistent um, volumes is it abstracts away the creation of the volumes from the actual consumption. So typically, you might have you know, the ops team managing the EBS volumes where the developers are really actually just consuming it. So this separation is actually extended out in Kubernetes. You can actually have one team managing the storage, whereas the developers can actually just get on with the job of writing code and then make requests for storage from a pool that's authorized and, you know, and uh, you know, um, actually something that you want to have. And this is actually kind of important because otherwise developers could just keep spinning up EBS volumes. And this probably happens nowhere, I'm sure. Um, and they end up with some huge AWS bill at the end of the, uh, end, end of the uh, month. So here what, we, what I've done basically, and I know it's pretty small, is basically I've created a persistent volume. It's an object in this case. And I've made, uh, I've made it sort of size 10 gigabytes I've given it some access modes. I've given it a file system, so in this case, X4. Um, and I've actually looked, hipped it up to a specific AWS volume in this case. So I've done the work, in this case anyway, of manually wiring up a particular volume. So I've created this, I've tied it up. That doesn't have to be the case, though. There is a dynamic provision. So I could choose for Kubernetes to dynamically provision the disk for me uh, instead. Um, so I've done that. I've basically created the volume. Um, and then basically what I do is then create a, a claim for it. Um, so in this claim, basically what I'm saying is I want this volume, this EBS volume, to be back to be backing for MongoDB. This is what I want it to be used for. Um, in this case, I want to make a request for 10 gigabytes. Well, luckily I've got a 10 gigabyte volume that's already in my pool. Um, so Kubernetes will basically match up, uh, in this case, the persistent volume with the claim, and the claim will then bind. So that means that later I can come back and use that claim. So for instance, if my pod um, were to make use of the claim, maybe the pod was to die, the node was to die, at some later date, um, the pod would be able to reuse that claim and reattach the disk effectively. That's what we get. We get a portable EBS volume, which of course is the point of having something like EBS on the, on the end of a network. What, is that, what happens behind the scenes? Well, Kubernetes does the, the hard work, I guess, of actually wiring it up for you. So it's gonna go ahead and work out where this volume is, do the various mounts, uh, mount it into the container, and, be, and use it with Docker. Cool. Okay, so let's let's just take uh, let's just take a quick look. Yep. Okay. Let's just take a look at some of these PVs so we can actually see them in action. Let's, let's maximize that. Okay, so I'm going to connect to the bastion, hopefully. Good. Okay, um, and then I'll look at the manifests. Look at the PV. Oops, PV. So you can probably see here, yeah, here's my MongoDB volume I created. It's backed by EBS. I've then got a persistent volume claim. So this is my claim for that volume. In this case, that, that has been matched here. It's been bound. So therefore, my claim has, has you know, exclusive use of that, uh, of that volume. What I can now do is I can now take advantage of that when I want to launch my actual container. So... <laughs> let's, let's hope this, uh, this holds out. Let's look at deployment, actually. OK. And uh, as you can probably see, I'm going to scroll down here. Just show you actually no CMS. Might go see. 
scroll to the bottom here, so this is just an example YAML file I've got. Um, ooh. Well, I backed it. Interesting. Okay. Okay, so yeah, you can probably see I'm very, very, very bottom here. So basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a MongoDB volume, uh, creating, sorry, MongoDB, I'm macking it basically with that volume here, so you can probably see I'm making a claim for that piece of data. What this basically means is that I'm attaching my EBS volume, and I can always reattach it should the pod end up somewhere else, pretty much. So this is actually, this is actually running for me, so I can take a look at it, as you can probably see. I've got Mongo running, um, so that's all kind of good. Uh, okay, let's switch, switch back. Um, what I wanted to, wanted to talk about, a couple of extra things, and I'm wary of time. Let's just take a quick look at the time here. Good, okay. So what you can also do is bake in configuration. So James began to talk about this earlier. I think it's a really interesting thing to look at. It's, it's a 1.2 new feature, so this is, this is very bleeding edge. Um, 1.2 goes GA probably at the beginning of March. But this is this idea that you can basically take uh, configuration, you can actually put your key value config into Kubernetes as a resource, as an object that you can then consume. So rather than actually having to bake in configuration, let's say, for instance, the database name, maybe the database host, that type of thing, mm. uh, port numbers, um, you can get away without, without actually doing that. And you can actually use Kubernetes um, API. So in this case, what we're actually going to be doing is taking key values. I think I've probably got, hopefully, an example uh, which I can flick to. So I'm going to get the uh, config map. Uh, and as you can see here, I've actually got some config already. Let's kind of just take a look at it. Whoops. Um, there it is. It's got two bits of data. I'm going to describe it in a bit more detail. Let's describe. Here you go. Really, really simple. Basically, what I've got is I've got a database name and a username, which I'm storing. Now, the good thing about this is that I've, I've, it's, it's centralized. So it doesn't matter now uh, where which pod it, it comes up and where it comes up. It's always going to pull that central configuration, um, and it will be able to configure itself. Um, so therefore, um, I don't have to worry about having to bake that into the actual thing itself. One other thing that's probably worth talking about as well and pointing you at um, is our secrets. Um, so if you've got something much more like a, maybe like a password, for instance, you can actually, again, rather than baking in the password into the container image, um, what you can do instead is use Kubernetes um, secret resource. Um, so here what I'm doing is basically taking the database password and putting it into a secret. The secret then gets injected um, into, in this case, MongoDB. Um, to, to bootstrap the user, but also then goes into my actual application so that I can connect to MongoDB as well. Again, I'm not having to worry about baking these things in. Uh, I can just use Kubernetes to do it, to do it for me. And this is nice because it actually injects in the secrets into a 10.fs volume. So you basically you get something that sits in memory, uh, and then you can consume it in whatever way you kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of want. Okay, so one of the things I spoke about earlier was, was deployment. Um, what I first deployed was a application which basically just had a file-based backend. What I'm going to try and now do is show you how you can use deployments to go from one version to the other. So what I'm effectively going to do is um, I'm going to hopefully get us to from one version to the next. So what I've done here is I've got a new, new version of my deployment. So you can probably see what I've done is basically changed the image here. So I'm going from one version to the other. Let's say we've iterated, we've decided that a file-based database is just not the way to go. We really should back it by a database. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm pointing it at MongoDB instead. Um, I've got a variety of other things, as you can probably see here. I'm pulling some of that config out. I'm pulling the database name. I'm pulling the username. Um, come and find me if anyone's more interested in, in that kind of thing. I can talk, 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 you, talk you through it. OK, so that uh, looks all good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply it. Oops. Hopefully. A little bit of latency. <laughs> um, OK, so let's apply <coughs> this uh, new configuration. So basically what I'm doing to Kubernetes is I'm saying, look, things have changed. I now want you to manage the replication control and manage the pods and change them from running one container image to the other. And the nice thing about this, it's server side. I've just handed the task over to Kubernetes to manage. And it's going to do a rolling upgrade. So it's taking all of the pods that were running one instance, and then it's going to upgrade it to the new version. And you get a lot of control over how that happens. You, know, you can control you know, the speed at which that happens. You can offer things like rollback as well. So fingers crossed, this, this might perhaps work. We'll see. Let's look at the pods. Oh, doesn't look too healthy, actually. Let's do delete the deployment. 
Yeah, we'll just kind of watch that a minute. Okay, you can probably see here it's launched a new, uh, new version, so I've got a new one running. Uh, let's go and take a look. Take a look at that. That's kind of cool. Okay, I'm going to switch back. Um, so servers are basically our way of exposing all of this. Um, I think James spoke about it earlier, so I'll probably uh, have to skip a little bit. I'm probably going to skip to this diagram. Basically, Kubernetes enables you to expose your pods in a variety of ways because your pods, remember, are fungible. They can come and go. You know, nodes may, may come up, they may come down, or may, and that's an issue because then things pods end up becoming rescheduled. So for this very reason, you basically get an abstraction which is above it, which is a service abstraction, and that enables you to expose it to Kubernetes native client. So basically, if you've got a client that can talk to the API, well, the API can find out where the pods are and how to find them. Um, um, or you can use non-native clients. So basically, this is the great thing. Basically, what it does is it creates you a virtual IP. So rather than you referring to this, the actual IP of the pod and having to remember what it is, particularly if it changes, um, you can just use a single stable identity, which is the VIP. Um, and that VIP is always accessible. The reason the VIP is accessible is because you've got a proxy which runs, does loads of IP tables, magicry, magic in the background. Um, but what it means is that I can just singly use that identity. And you probably noticed in some of those YAML files that I was talking to Mongo. I wasn't talking directly to the Mongo pod. I was actually talking to a, a VIP, effectively, which sat in front of it. And that would mean that Mongo could change its IP and it would still continue to work. We also a couple of other options here. We've got environment variables. Uh, I think James mentioned that. And you've also got DNS. So if you really like DNS, you can uh, use something called SkyDNS, which is going to do all the hard, all the hard work of kind of maintaining these things for you. So what we get is a cluster IP. I've seen the time, so I'm going to skip it quickly. Um, we can also open node ports, and we can also use load balancers. And one of the things that's just made it, um, and you can obviously read, and you can see my slides when I share them, is something called ingress. So this is a way of defining basically how traffic gets from the outside world into, into Kubernetes, effectively. And it's got a very, very neat way of describing that. So if you're running you know, multiple services, and let's say you have multiple microservices that are running internally, um, you want to use kind of layer seven based load balancing, you know, you want to have paths, you want to you know, route those through to the correct service internally. You've, there's a very nice way of now describing it using YAML, and this is kind of using an ingress. How does it work? Um, well, effectively, it basically, in this case, um, enables you to take uh, an elastic load balancer, which is what I'm going to do, uh, hopefully pretty shortly. Um, it will then basically write for you, in this case, uh, what I'm using anyway, is an Nginx controller. So it will read basically all of this configuration, and it will dynamically configure Nginx to do the layer 7 load balancing um, for you. So what you end up with is the ability to just have a single load balancer at the very top. This load balances at layer 3 and layer 4 across all of your nodes, in this case running in AWS. Um, it then hits um, it then hits a node port, which is running Nginx. Nginx does layer, so layer 7 load balancing. Um, and then it hits... Um, the DNS, and the DNS does the load balancing across the pods. <laughs> Hopefully, if you followed that, um, then, uh, then what it means is effectively you've, you've got the ability um, to get something up and running quite quickly that can, can scale and can be kind of hi highly available. So what I'm going to try and do very, very quickly, because I'm wary of time, well, is I'm just going to create um, Nginx. OK. Um, OK, and watch this. Um, OK, so Nginx has started. Basically, Nginx now has spoken to the API server. It's got that ingress, so it understands all of my ingress points. Um, it's going to do proxy passing. So if, if anyone's used that before, it's just a standard proxy passing. Um, so hopefully now, basically what I've got is on port 3000, I've got something running. Yeah, let's... I can probably just take a look at that kind of thing for it as well. So I've got a bunch of services all running. Hopefully they're all backed. Yep, so it's all fine. Um, let me just get rid of that. Let's see if we can grab a copy of Chrome. And here we go. We've got an elastic load balancer. Um, let's see. Da -da -da. It's done. It's done. So basically we've got um, what's, what's it doing? Uh, effectively, it's and you can, anyone can visit this, by the way. So you can use and abuse it if you, if you fancy. Um, but basically I can... Hopefully, type something here, uh, and it will. Oh, 
here's my title. I'm going into a title and some content. Um, and it will then basically use the microservices that I've got under the bonnet. Um, which will be, be the case. Okay. Good. Okay, let me switch back. So that's basically sitting on top of an elastic load balance. So that's doing the load balancing, and you've then got layer seven uh, under under the bonnet. If anyone's got any questions, please come and find me. But what I'd probably say is, it's a really really good chance to take a look at the project. It's developing all the time. It's uh, a project that uh, obviously has been developed by Google, so you can be pretty sure that it's going to scale. It's going to do a lot of things that you hopefully won't need it to, to to do as well. So come and find me afterwards if you have any any questions. And apologies for going a few minutes over there as well. Thank you very much.